Psalm 135, verses 1 through 21. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, you that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for he is gracious. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel, as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great. Our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord does, he, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and on earth, in the seas and in all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. He it was who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both human beings and animals. He sent signs and wonders into your midst, O Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his servants. He struck down many nations and killed mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to his people, Israel. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear, and there is no breath in their mouths. Those who make them and all who trust them shall become like them. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion, he who resides in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, may these, the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Psalm 135 belongs to a special category of psalms. They're called Hallel Psalms. And if that name Hallel sounds a little bit familiar, it's because we have the term Hallelujah that is derived from it. And all of the Hallel Psalms begin with that Hebrew phrase Hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. And that reminds me of a story. It's the story of the woman who bought a parrot from the pet store. It was a female parrot. And the pet store owner assured her that this was indeed a talking parrot. But the woman quickly learned that her parrot was silent most of the time, except for when she had guests come over to her house, at which point the parrot, in a sexy, seductive voice, would say, Hey, cutie. Want to have some fun? Embarrassed and dismayed at this, the woman consulted with her pastor, who happened to be the owner of a talking parrot as well, a talking male parrot. And so her pastor reassured her, saying, you know, my parrot is very religious and spends all of his time praying and reading the Bible why don't you bring your parrot over for a visit, and I'm sure he'll be a good influence on her. Well, on the day of the arranged visit, sure enough, the pastor's parrot was deeply immersed in reading the Bible and praying. And when the female parrot was placed in his cage, he simply ignored her. And then she said in her most seductive voice, Hey, cutie. Want to have some fun? At which point, the pastor's parrot slammed his little Bible shut, raised his beak to heaven, and said, Praise the Lord! My prayers have been answered. Praise the Lord. The first two verses of Psalm 135, our scripture today, are a call to worship. 
inviting all servants of the Lord to praise his name and all those who stand in the house of the Lord or in the courts of the house of the Lord. Basically, all who are gathered anywhere in the vicinity of what would have been the ancient temple in Jerusalem where this psalm would have been used as part of worship. Now, for what it's worth, Presbyterians typically begin all of our worship services with a call to worship as well. Sometimes it's a song praising God and inviting everyone to join in together in the singing. Sometimes it's the bells chiming the hour, letting everyone know that now is the time to worship. Sometimes it's simply a scripture or a prayer that lets us know it's time to worship. Regardless of the method, everyone in the call to worship is invited to cease their individual activities, their individual conversations, texting on their phones, right? <laughs> and then come together, join together as one body, one community, praising God together. Having called the people to worship, to praise God, Psalm 135 goes on to give all the reasons why we should praise God. The first, this is the first half of the psalm, verses 3 through 12. And among those reasons that we are given, one, or verse 3, the Lord is good and gracious. Verse 4, he has chosen Israel for himself as his own special possession. And I think we need to remember that this is the people in Jerusalem, the people of Israel who would have been using this as worship. So it's their way of saying God has chosen us to be special. We can map that onto our own experience as well. Verse 5, we worship God because he is great above all other gods. This is an interesting verse because you notice gods in the plural. This is one of those psalms that does not deny the existence of the other gods, just that the God of Israel is greater. Monotheism, the idea that only one God exists, came later in Israel's history, um, after this psalm was written. But this psalm still calls for monolatry, which is worship of one God alone. Also, verses 6 and 7 speak of God's creation. The heavens and the earth, the seas and clouds, the lightning, the rain, the wind, all of these things that when we take the time to actually observe them in wonder, they beckon for us to praise the one who has the power and the imagination to create and orchestrate it all. I love that. I love this thought, the idea that when we hear the thunder, when we feel the rain or the wind on our face, when we dive in deep into the cool waters, all of those things can be acts of worship if we remember in those moments, who made them, and if we give thanks for that and for them. Verses 8 through 12 tell a story. They tell the history of the people who are worshiping God, the history in this case of Israel, and how they perceived God to be at work in their history providing for them, leading them out of slavery in Egypt, defeating enemies that they couldn't have possibly defeated on their own, and providing them a home and a heritage in a new land. You have a story too, every one of you. And most of you, I think, can probably look back on your life, look back on the life of your family and even your ancestors and with that kind of distance, see how God was working and moving to bring your family, your ancestors, and you to this point, to the place you are today, often sheltering you through harm and danger and providing a place for you, a home for you, and an identity. Verse 13 is the climax of the psalm. And the psalmist, presumably along with the people who are singing this as part of their worship. The psalmist turns from speaking about God, all the things that God has done for us, who God is, and now speaks directly to God, 
Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout the ages. This is an important thing for us to remember in our worship, in our prayers, and in our lives. Sometimes we speak about God. We share with the things that God has done for us. We reflect on the blessings in our lives and in our experiences. But then other times we speak to God directly and we give to God thanks for all that is good and holy in this world and in your life. Verse 14 is one more reason why we praise God, because he will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. And then having given all this praise to God, there's a shift in verses 15 through 18 that sets up a contrast with God and other gods, or in this case, idols, the things that we worship that are not God, things like gold and silver, the things that we make for ourselves that have no life and no soul. I love verse 19, which implies that whatever it is that we worship, whatever it is that we value or put our trust in most, we will become like those things. This is the biblical equivalent of you are what you eat, only it's you are what you worship. You are what you prize. If money is what you value most, then you will become cold and hardened like your money. If your career is what you worship, then your career will consume you and you will become your career. If you worship political leaders and their empty promises, you will become like those empty promises. That's especially a scary thought this month, isn't it? But if you worship a God of compassion and love, you will become like those things. You will become compassionate and loving. Psalm 135 ends as it began, calling people to worship, but now at the end, it calls more and more people, more tribes, more houses to bless and praise the Lord. As I mentioned earlier, this is the final psalm in our series, and I think it is a fitting conclusion. It's a fitting end because it's a great example of what I think God looks for and hopes for in our worship, in our prayers, and in our lives. Above all else in this psalm, there is a sense of wonder that pervades the entire psalm. In your worship, in your prayers, and in your lives, I hope you never lose that sense of wonder. I hope you never lose the ability to see the world around you and be amazed at small and simple things that God has created, the things that God is doing, and all that God has provided for you. This ability, the ability to see that kind of wonder in the world is so important that our church has adopted it as part of our vision statement. Our vision statement here at First Presbyterian Church is to be a church for wanderers, wonderers, and wisdom seekers. What does it mean to be a church for wanderers? I think the ones who wrote Psalm 135 all those millennia ago in Jerusalem were a church of wanderers. Psalm 135 begins with wonder at the world around us, God's creation, nature, beauty, the vastness of the heavens and earth. But then it moves to an inward kind of wonder, amazement that God has chosen us. Who are we? And yet God chose us just as he chose Jacob and the people of Israel. We too are God's children. And God loved us enough to send his son to teach us, to redeem us, to save us from ourselves. God calls us his treasured possession. And that means that among all the vastness of all the billions of stars and planets, 
We are special. You are special. Next, Psalm 35 calls us to wonder. And this time, I mean a different sense of wonder. Wonder can also mean doubt and skepticism. I wonder about that. And so this time, Psalm 135 calls us to wonder about all the things that we are naturally inclined to follow, but things that are not really worth our time, the things that don't really matter in the grand eternal scheme of things. All the things we spin our wheels chasing after, things of our own creation that are not God, not wonderful, not eternal. Finally, Psalm 135 invites us to broaden our sense of wonder as we go through this life to include more and more in our worship, in our prayers, in our lives, more tribes, more people, more families, more nations. If you want all this in a nutshell, here it is, Psalm 135. Number one, the universe and the world around us is wonderful. Number two, you as God's special creation are wonderful. Number three, gold and silver and lifeless material things are not wonderful and not worthy of our worship or our time. Number four, God's wonders rightfully belong to everyone, to all people in all times and places. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.